Hello, my name is Philip Camella, and today we're going to have a conversation beyond science and religion. Breaking new ground in thinking, exploring the outer limits of what we know about the world and ourselves, unhindered by common beliefs and perceptions. This is Conversations Beyond Science and Religion, taking on subjects from the Big Bang, the multiverse, and evolution to the supernatural and the new rising consciousness. This is where scientists, philosophers, New Agers, and spiritualists come together to discuss where this world may be heading. Now here's your host, lawyer, philosopher, and the author of The Collapse of Materialism, Philip Camella. Now, there's something about dreams that have always filled the mind with wonder. I think that the the term dreams ranks up there with God as concepts that have throughout history pervaded the mind of humankind. We see dreams in countless books, commercials, songs. We, we hear constantly about athletes who win an Olympic gold medal or who win the Super Bowl and say that their dreams have come true or they feel like they're dreaming. We all have had these experiences uh, in our lives, and I think that um, one observation we can make here is that the concept of dreams and dreaming It not only pervades the spiritual world, but it also pervades the materialistic world. And by that, I mean the worldview of modern science. And for example, there's three books which uh, I have, uh, all written by current materialistic scientists. One's called Dreams of a Final Theory by Steven Weinberg. In other words, called Dreams of Reason by Harry Pagel. There's Einstein's dreams. And so what's what's curious here, and the point I'm making, is that even in the materialistic world, the world of the machine, the world of particles and forces, we still have scientists using the dream as metaphor. And it raises the question to me, is to what degree are dreams merely metaphorical, and in which ways is it literal? In which ways... If any, do dreams have meaning? Do they have power in the world we live in? This this raises the question of when do we stop dreaming? What limits our dreams? And there is no doubt that when we're young is when we're taught some lessons about the limitations we have as humans. To me, it was doubt. It was, it, to me, I had to overcome doubt to dream bigger. I have on my uh, my counter here a book called um, The Magic of Thinking Big. I, I recently read about uh, one of the great uh, lessons of, of uh, a famous person whose name I don't remember, but uh, his regret or her regret was that, that, that they did not dream bigger um, in their life, even though they accomplished a lot. So this circles back to what happens at our youth. What happens when we're young? And is there something we can do to to motivate, to power the ability of dreaming and to make it more uh, real for all of us? Which brings us to our guest today. His name is Brent Feinberg, and he is a best-selling children's book author. He was born in 1990 in South Africa and is also an integrative healer and practitioner in consciousness-based health care. But what's also interesting about Brent is he's written a brand new book called uh, Freeing Freddy the Dream Weaver, uh, which also has an activity book and also um, a workbook that comes with it. And what's interesting about this is that is that Brent is bringing some concepts, some of these new age concepts, and introducing them to not only children, but his book says ages 12 and above. And I think not only are the books uh, written for everybody, but obviously the principles are. Brent, welcome to the show. Thank you, Phil, for having me on. Okay, so first, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to write this book? 
Free and Freddy. So I grew up in South Africa, and my mom runs a big organization called the Tomorrow Trust there where they do education for orphans and vulnerable children. And I was strongly involved while I was there for many years. And I was in Bali. I was doing a yoga teacher training course a few years ago. And I thought, right, I'm going to write a children's book to raise awareness and funds for the foundation. And also as a tool we can use for the students to help them deal with challenges and fear in their lives. Okay, so so what is it? Now, one of the the uh, messages in your book, um, Freeing Freddy, the Dreamweaver, is that it's fear stands in opposition to dreaming big. What is it about fear that that is the motivator here or put differently do you think that fear is necessary in order to motivate the incentive to dream no fear is like you said in opposition of dreaming because what fear does is it makes the mind smaller it puts tension and stress in the body and it limits the ability of the mind to be expansive to imagine grand things that people can go out and then create in their lives and in the world. Yeah, and I think that what what uh, comes across to me here, and that is so important because uh, Brent uses the metaphor of a spider in his web to sort of picture uh, the fear, and of course, as I mentioned, the book is called Free and Freddy, The Dream Weaver, um, that the mind itself weaves the web of fear that's that's one of the if it if it's un um untaught then the mind itself is the source of the fear is that is that right yes that that is definitely correct and fear sits in the mind and body the body and mind are one system they are integrated and are not separate, so they can be viewed as completely one. Yeah. Now, now one of the, one of the things that uh, that comes up in our modern culture, and you know, I've been doing the show for a while, and I've read all sorts of books um, on um, the mind body connection and the placebo effect, and uh, Deepak Chopra and Rupert Sheldrake, and all these guys. Um, when you when you write and speak, to what degree are you talking metaphorically? In other words, you just mentioned that the mind and body are one thing. Do you mean that they're actually one thing, or or are you drifting into a metaphor when you? No, they they are actually one thing. Yeah. Um, the the consciousness of the body is completely integrated. The DNA in your toe knows exactly what's going on with the DNA in your face. And all the organs, all the body parts are in constant energetic communication with each other. Yeah, I noticed that uh, at the end of your book, you talk about um, that we are all beings of light. Is that what you mean by beings of light? Um. By beings of light, I mean that at the essential level of of pure being, of pure consciousness, our true selves, we are all light. At that level of pure awareness, of pure being, our true selves, that is light. And it's the highest form of consciousness energy. When we strip away the, the personality when we strip away anxiety and fears and all of these things, then we are just these light consciousness beings. Yeah, I, th- I think that what's interesting here uh, on many levels is that we have different people from different parts of the, of the world, different, um, different areas of thought, uh, different disciplines, sort of coming at... Uh, the same issue from different directions, but reaching the same conclusion. When when I I just got done with a draft of, of a of a book that I've titled "The Boy Who Found the Place of Miracles," and I haven't quite 
uh, sh- uh, sort of shined it up yet, but it's just about done. But one of the one of the conclusions I come to, very similar, is that we have scientists who tell us that we are um, sort of stardust, uh, residues of stars, and it sounds very poetic. Uh, but I think it is better calling ourselves um, beings of light. I like I like the light that the part of stars that we share is the light. It's not the particle, and and so, frankly, I think that that's where this new age and I'm using new age or new spirituality movement is going, uh, which is recognizing this is a truth that. We are energetic at the core. Uh, Einstein was half right uh, when he said that there's an equivalence between matter and energy. But, but I'm just wondering, from, from your background, you know, you, you go beyond writing children's books. Um, your, your metaphysics is essentially uh, that we are energetic beings, we're creatures of light, beings of light. Mind and body are the same thing. How, how did you how did you come to this um, result conclusion? Well, definitely through studying lots of different philosophies. I've studied all the major religions. I've sought out to understand the common thread, and if you can see truth in one place and recognize it in another, then truth is infinite and everlasting it doesn't change so when you see the truth then you can be able to recognize it and convey it in in a new way or in a way that is more understandable to people um, a lot of experiencing the the energy of oneness and this light consciousness is through personal experience through um, daily practice of meditation um, through becoming a body talk practitioner body talk is a phenomenal integrative healing modality that deals with the consciousness of all the body parts the the information makeup the energetic packages of the mind and body how they interrelate and how they need to be in resonance and communication with each other for the body to be in optimal health and I've seen amazing results with personal clients and with clients of other practitioners. Um, So I've seen it in so many ways where you change the mind and the body changes. Yeah. And vice versa in a lot of what you see in yoga practice, moving the body. When you move the body in a certain way, you move the breath, the mind changes. So you can see by changing the mind, you change the body. By changing the body, you change the mind. If you eat the right foods, the right information, clean, organic, plant-based diet, then the mind changes. People are happier, more vibrant. Yeah, I, I, that sounds like uh, there, there's a lot of uh, thoughts there, and I, I'm going to draw out a couple of them. One of them is uh, that... Many many scientists um, take a provisional attitude towards truth or towards the final theory, as if as if we'll never find the the ultimate um, theory of everything, which is which is healthy in a way. Um, I wish it was true for them, but I I disagree with that thought. I agree with you that there is a truth. And what you're saying, I think, is very, very close to being right there, if not right on point with what I think in terms of of what the what what the truth is. And and what do you and I go further because I think that as confidence builds up in that that this is the truth, that we're one, we're energetic beings, that the mind and body are the same thing. I frankly think the body is an expression of mind uh, that. It becomes more deeply rooted and it spreads. Do you have? Do you do you think this is an individual pursuit, or do you think that there is strength in masses or in in common common beliefs? Yes, of course. Collective consciousness is very powerful. Um, 
groups of people together create create greater change yeah well that that's that's encouraging now i before i circle back to that obviously in 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 your book you're focusing on youth and you're focusing on sort of clearing the deck at a young age why 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 are you doing that why why is this geared towards younger folk well i think first of all the principles of higher consciousness are actually very simple and it's the complexity that adults develop in their minds that struggle to understand it children's minds are so open they they readily accept these concepts because they they natural these the concepts i present in freeing freddy are are natural to the way of of the universe to the way of um truthful being and children can understand it and if they can integrate it into their lives at an early age they'll have much happier easier flowing and lives filled with more meaning and purpose um a big part of freeing freddy the dream weaver and the workbook and the activity book is to help children and their parents open communication between each other to learn and understand each other better and connect with their own inner passion and purpose and it took me a few years and i struggled to find what i felt like my path in life was and if we can give tools to children to to know this it can save them a lot of strife um as i had to go through myself and many others did um i'm just trying to make children have a easier more fulfilling perspective on life yeah and this is to me powerful because of a couple things first there is i forget who said who said it you may you may um recall it but somebody said that all education is is uh unlearning things we were taught when we were young and i think there's a lot of truth to that which is many of us as we get into our teens etc and move on we are trying to unwrap beliefs limitations that we had when we were young that that were impregnated upon us whether it's orthodox religion whether it's limitations in culture in upbringing in religion uh and if you if you apply these principles earlier uh there's there's less to unlearn <laughs> and so it's sort of like uh being being trained to be a skier when you're younger something i was never trained to be and i'm terrible uh but i feel like the, the there is a real advantage to doing this when folks are younger because there's less to unlearn Yes, 100% agree with you. Yeah, and yeah. So because I I mentioned I mentioned myself, I mean my big struggle to be a little personal is is I had this doubt. I mean, my uh I was a philosophy major in college and a lot of what I was reading was sort of unwrapping things that I had learned or or things that I thought were true. And there is no doubt, you know, fear fear is important. Fear. I mean, it's a concept, but but I I think you would agree that fear comes in many many um, variations. For example, many people are afraid to question authority. I mean, has, is that is it, does that qualify as something that that is a limiting fear yes. factor? Yeah. Yes, because. Um, people should be free to express themselves in the way that they they desire if it comes from a place of compassion and wanting to truly learn um like you said fears could be anything fear of not being good enough fear of failure is very common that means people don't even try because they're too scared to even attempt to go after their dreams and goals in life yeah. um fear of being alone people stay in relationships that are destructive because of fear um so fear is so pervasive yeah yeah the, there's no doubt that everybody has it and I, um i tell people along the same lines that i'm a i'm a lawyer and one 
thing I say to young folks is that one one reason I'm halfway decent is because I've made so many mistakes. I've learned from them. And one of the, I think this is another lesson in my own mind, which is that if you face a fear, for example, public speaking, and you you stand up and you give a talk and you actually don't do very well because you're nervous or you can't articulate, well, at least you, you have now broken through the initial fear barrier, but now you have learned from that experience. But I, it's sort of like you've got to take that first step to break through the fear barrier to start, to start the game. You know, you've got to get in the game. And yes, hundred um, percent. I've experienced that personally myself. My self-esteem in school was so low; I couldn't even speak in the classroom. Yeah. And I knew I wanted to speak to groups of people, and now I do. I speak to large audiences of hundreds of people sometimes. And the initial thing was like, I want to speak to groups of people. I need to overcome this fear. So in the beginning, when I was at university. I was just put up my hand and talk in front of the auditorium just to just to speak in public. And um, I, the first time I did it, um, I felt like that churning, you know, the butterflies, that yeah. that thing moving inside of you. And I thought, right, this is fear, this is anxiety, or is it just energy moving, emotion, energy in motion? And after I got up, I spoke the that energy was gone so now when i feel it i'm like right this is an opportunity when i feel those butterflies when i feel that energy moving in my stomach or in my chest i'm like this is an opportunity to become free to overcome something so it's about shifting your perspective and fear is completely normal everyone has fear so there's nothing to be ashamed of it's just a construct of the mind and when you approach it like that that fear is normal then you can pinpoint your fears exactly, know what they are. You can't let go of something if you don't even know what it is and then address it accordingly. And there are tools in the workbook and freeing Freddie the Dreamweaver. I know our conversation is serious, but it's really a fun story. Kids love it and parents will take great joy in reading it with their children. Yeah, I I think it is I think it is a very uh well done book and I think it's something that uh kids of all ages um would would uh, would appreciate and I but and I also think that what uh distinguishes it is that it's got a lifelong message in it. You know, the the um the little engine that could uh, that book is is uh, a classic. So many so many people um, refer to that book as as being sort of a life uh, a source of life lessons. And I think that the Freeing Freddy is sort of the new version um, of that book. Now, as we as we come to the end here, uh, in the beginning, I I talked about sort of the, the spectrum of of dreaming where uh, in in many instances uh, dreams are used metaphorically where for example uh, you dream about living longer or looking younger longer or being happier and and most people would say if they say that out loud they're laughed at because because quote unquote everybody knows the truth um, what what is your view on on dreaming to the extent it, are, do you mean that it's literal that in other words we can change ourselves we can change the world or or is, is there some metaphorical sense that you're um, using it in no in this term i'm speaking completely literally we we encouraging people to go within themselves to engage the imagination to connect with their passion and purpose and begin to see it, begin to dream it. If you want to create anything in the world, whether it be a building as an architect or a garden as a landscaper, you have to have the vision of it first. And dreaming is a very high thought form because it because it's connected with your passion, your heart's involved, 
and then you can go and put an action plan in process things don't materialize overnight not generally anyway but you can have this grand vision this beautiful dream that comes from within yourself that's not given to you by social conditioning or your parents it's exactly what you want to create in the world and and use that right hemisphere of the brain engaging different parts of the mind and then go out and create it so dreaming is a really powerful tool if you are not able to if we are not able to see what we want to create in our lives and in the world how can we possibly go out and create it yeah i think i think that's really i think that is is well said and uh brent why don't you uh tell folks uh how to find you in your book so our website is www with love from freddy.com and on there you can see the books and the workshops and the different ways we engage with communities uh, the books are available on amazon freddy is with an ie at the end so f-r-e-d-d-i-e and please follow us on social media with love from freddy on facebook and on instagram and the the ending point i will make here is that this this book is is really for everybody i i enjoyed it it succinctly states uh what what is written in hundreds of pages of books by other authors uh it obviously is good for kids uh and it's something that i think in in our new world we should be we should be teaching our kids um to to dream big on that point uh to agree with brent here uh, I'm th- I, I think of Pascal's wager, um, where Pascal back in the, about the 18th century said that he he believed in God because just in case God did really exist, uh, the the reward would be eternal life, and therefore he thought that as a logical matter it was better to to place his his bets on God's existence. Well, I. I think that it's better to believe that the world really is a dream or fulfills dreams because if it's true, then our dreams really will come true. And frankly, there's no evidence that that cannot happen. So I think it's a more positive mindset to take the unlimited approach to dream big and to keep your your vision on your goals. This is Philip Camello. This is Conversations Beyond Science and Religion. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Conversations Beyond Science and Religion, hosted by Philip Camella. To find out more about Philip and his book, The Collapse of Materialism, visit thecollapseofmaterialism.com.